Okay, happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started now. Uh, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Niles Main District Library Board. Uh, may I please have a roll call? Cindy, are you gonna be doing that? I am. Okay. Okay. Um, Karen Diamond. Here. Carolyn Derblick. Here. Becky Keen Adams. Here. Diane Olson. Here. Patty Rosansky. Here. And Linda Ryan. Here. Okay, thank you. Uh, what we'll now do is stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. There we go. Uh-oh. Okay, all right. Um, I pledge allegiance and to the flag, the flag of the United States, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, which it stands. One, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible. With liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, so let's just move on with our agenda then. The next thing we have on the agenda is the approval of minutes. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting of February 17th, 2021? I have a motion from Patty, who's our second. Second from Diane. All right. Um, are there any corrections or uh, comments about the minutes of February 17th? All right, then uh, would you give us a roll call, Cindy? Yes. Um, Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Becky? Yes. Diane? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's now time for public comment. Um, Susan or Cindy, can you tell us, do we have any requests for public comment? I don't see any. Oh wait, no, Steve Yassel has his hand up. All right. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, good evening. Um, just wanted to uh, comment on um, just, I guess, what's going on the past few months. Um, I'm a bit disappointed in the way the appointments of the trustees went, uh, considering one is now not on the board anymore and not running for election. Um, I just, I wish that would have been handled better and I hope it does get handled better in the future if that comes up again. Um, also, <laughs> I don't know how you guys are scaring away all these contractors for the roof. Maybe it might be a good thing to put it off um, until everything's open in the state to consider doing expenditures like that. But um, other than that, that's all I got to say. Hope you all are having a great St. Patty's Day and uh, have some of that corned beef. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, are there any other individuals who are now uh, seeking to comment publicly, Susan? I do not see anyone. All right, fine. Okay, then we will move on to trustee reports. Uh, as far as the president reports, I don't have too much to say. Other than, uh, and I was pleased to see that District 63 School District uh, did put something in their newsletter about our library, and that is specifically, okay, you can't see that, but sir, it is uh, the student who is president for a day of yes. the Niles Main District Library. She's a uh, Nelson student. So, okay, there it is. You have it. Um, anyway, I was pleased to see that uh, that made their newsletter, too. And uh, that was very fun to have her do that. So uh, other than that, I don't think I have any comments right now. So I will ask any of the other trustees 
if they have reports. Okay. Um, seeing none, I'll turn to our treasurer. Uh, Carolyn, a, where, where, did you have a report? Yeah, quick, just a quick comment. Yes, um, I've. Um, I think over the past couple of weeks, there's been um, quite a bit of activity on um, social media. And um, when comments are made, I I'm sure that you all get um, text messages or people are calling you questioning the comments like me. But I just wanted to mention that um, sometimes those Facebook posts turn out to be pretty um, argumentative or actually disrespectful. And as trustees, I, I know we everybody can't like us and we can't like everybody, but I think the way we handle these conversations is so important because it just ends up all over the community. And um, there was another situation. I got a couple of um, messages at work. Um, I think during, during the day, apparently, um, Oh, I think it was Friday morning. I think during the day, Greg Pritz was posting on Facebook. I'm not sure the subject, yet. it could have been Kadir, I'm not sure. But um, then of course, I don't, the message I get is what is staff doing on Facebook during the day? Those are my tax dollars they're wasting. So, um, and, and what was upsetting is, the, is his post indicated that he was doing that simply because Susan Lemke couldn't access it. So that sort of puts our two top employees in a negative sort of light. So I'm just asking we be a little more careful about when we post whatever we post because it all just looks so negative and we'd like to like try to eliminate that as best we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I, you know, I just want to say, uh, Generally, uh, during a work, work day, employees do have breaks and lunch hours when they can post uh, uh, personal comments uh, unless the employer has a policy against that. And I don't know if we have a specific policy against that. And, and also the Niles Library does uh, have its own Facebook page too, where, where our staff are sort of expected to put some posts up there regarding the library. So uh, being on Facebook during work time sometimes is appropriate for one reason or another. Um, and, well, and there's a pretty thin line there. There's a pretty thin line. So, you know, but I'm just saying most people at work aren't on Facebook, but I don't know. I have no idea what the allowances are at the library. As a matter of fact, I'd like to know. Uh -huh. uh, Greg, would you like to comment on this? I don't know if you can recall what uh, is being referred to or not. Um, yeah, I know exactly what she's talking about. Um, so two things about it. Uh, the first was the post was uh, meant to share the correct information uh, about uh, uh, Umer Kadir's uh, resignation and the point that was brought up at, at the uh, immediately previous uh, uh, Board of Trustees meeting. So that's the first point. Second point was on that Friday, I was off. I was not working on that Friday. That's great to know. I wish I knew it that day, but thank you. And um, I did not respond to any um, any further uh, any further uh, uh, posts on uh, everything, Niles. Well, what was noted also there was a comment about you being on during work hours, and then all of a sudden you hid the post. So I mean, it, the whole thing just didn't appear as good as I, it could. I didn't. I didn't so hide. You were home. I didn't hide anything. I responded to a post, and what you know, if it's there or if it's not there, is something it was that's, removed. Uh, well, that's not anything that I did. Greg would not. Have Carolyn, are you on that page, Carolyn? No, I'm getting calls and text messages from the whole world. Might be. I don't spend a lot you know, of time on Facebook. If you want to understand what's going on, it might be helpful to be on there. No, I believe me, I, I, I hear it all. I check it out now and then. It's I don't want to be part of that. It's it's not the most, it doesn't spread the most positive information. It's more opinions than facts. And it's it's not for me. I, I, I'd rather use, I'd rather 
be more factual and not end up in a huge battle with people, which is all that ends up doing. And it just causes ill feelings. But, that's but I'm well aware, aware of what's on there. <laughs> I'm well, pardon me? Pardon me? by bringing it up now, that's kind of what's happening anyway. Move on to our financial No, reports. it's, it's, okay. it's all important about our image as trustees. We're not just, you know, regular people. We are trustees and we should hold ourselves to a little higher standard. That's the I only point that. I want to make. Thank Penny, you. Are you ready for our trustees report? You're on mute though, I just, in case you uh, forgot that. I was just making sure everybody else was finished. I didn't want to okay, interrupt fine. anyone. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have a report for us, Penny? Yeah, of course I do. Okay, thank you. This report is for February, the seventh month of the fiscal year. We are now 58% of the way through the fiscal year. Revenues, property taxes are at 48% of the budget. Investments are at 120% of the budget. Total revenues are at 50% of the budget. <clears throat> Expenditures, total salaries are are at 71% of the budget. Library materials, total library materials is uh, at 68% of the budget. Library operating expenditures are at 38% of the budget. General administration is at 57% of the budget. Um, employee Fringe benefits is at 69% of the budget. Utilities is at 57% of the budget. Total liability expenditures, 103% of the budget. Total Social Security expenditures, 71% of the budget. Workman's comp is at 61%. Unemployment compensation, 24%. Building and equipment is at 38%. Our total expenditures are at 52% of the budget. Um, I was looking, as I've been doing lately, and this time what I did is anything over 5,000 because I didn't want to go on forever about things that were less than 5,000. We know every month Blue Cross and Blue Shield is, is what it is. And that's 44,000. Ingram Library Services and uh, tends to change depending on what's ordered. And that has to do with mostly our books. Uh, Midwest Tape was 10,000. Uh, 526, and that has to do with DVDs and CDs as they are ordered. So that also varies depending on what the order was. Overdrive is eBooks, and that was uh, also depends on what's requested and what's ordered, and that was six thousand five hundred twenty-three dollars. Expert landscaping was for snowplow snow blowing and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And that was $5,107. Um, my question is, Susan, I know we tend to get our library, our, excuse me, library, our lawyer's bills after we get our um, report from you guys that we have. So do you have any idea if we've received that yet? Yes, we did receive it. Uh, this is the bill for up through January 31st. Okay. Um, I know our lawsuit is, is over. Do they have the final numbers on what it cost us for the lawsuit? Um, well, for this last month, it was uh, a cost of $3,801.75. So, we, it, other breaking it down more than that for the different things they were, that was our total bill for the lawyers, correct? It ended up being around $24,000, oh, uh, the it. lawsuit, which Mr. Thank McCoolay, you. just in case everybody had not heard, did lose. Okay, thank you very much. Um, right. Other than that, um, 
I didn't have anything else. If anybody has any questions. No, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Carolyn has a question. Um, yes, just um, to backtrack on the attorney's invoices. Susan, did you say you're only up to January? Uh, yes, this bill. Oh, January is. of this year, excuse me. Um, I'm thinking a year ago. I was going to say like, wow, we're really behind. Okay, so we are almost finished then, correct? That should be the end of the litigation cost, yes. Okay, great, great. My mistake. Okay, and then I did have a question um, regarding the, oh, can I ask, it's about the check register. Can I ask that now? Or no, that's a separate line item, right? No, no isn't that when you yeah, ask that's about part of the financial reports? Okay, thank you. Um, um, yeah, my question is, I noticed that there isn't a check for the um, Culver parking lot for this month, and there actually wasn't one for last month, but I thought maybe that was just an oversight or it wasn't posted, um, but I was just wondering um, why that is. Well, you recall that we, that their board, oh, I'm sorry, did you want to answer, Patty? I, I was going to say, the bo their board gave us, uh, was it six months? Yes. That they weren't going to charge us Correct. because of the pandemic. Okay, well, my point is, if you recall, at the January meeting, I believe it was on the agenda, and we discussed it. And at that time, um, Susan heard verbally, but not formally, that they um, were in agreement for a six-month moratorium. And that's when I brought up dissolving the um, lease agreements, um, which actually, now that I've checked my records, I've been asking to do that way back since 2018. But um, we ended the meeting and no decision was made. So I'm trying to figure out who made the decision to go with the six month moratorium because we certainly didn't vote on it. Well, you know, we did vote to enter into that contract, I believe a long time ago. Uh, I mean, it's been many right. years. And uh, what Susan has done is gotten us a, you know, a benefit of getting a six months, not having to pay something that we originally said we were gonna pay, that is every month under that lease. So I, I don't think we typically have to vote on Decisions? not paying for something we would otherwise have to pay for. Well, the purpose uh, so of the... I don't, um... I don't really think that's, you know, it's certainly not an expenditure we were making. If anything, we are saving a lot of money by not having to pay that bill for six months. Okay, well, the point is there's a legal agreement with the school. The conversation was a six month moratorium or my recommendation to dissolve the lease. And we made no decision, but yet we moved forward. So oh, these are two different issues: dissolving the lease and okay, no, can I getting finish, please? a benefit issue. of the no, school the point district is, saying we the won't please, charge you please for stop. six months. The point is, you so, moved forward without any direction from the board. Who approved this? Who was there? It should have been documented. Who signed off on it? Well, I do believe there is an agreement, uh, Susan, that you have reached with the school not to, for them to, whereby they agreed not to charge us for a period of six months. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have an agreement with the school, but the uh, what I did is I talked to the superintendent and asked if he would be willing to take it to his board of trustees or the school board and ask them if they would be willing to do a moratorium for six months. And he went to them and they voted to allow us to have a moratorium for six months. Carolyn did at the meeting where I was reporting back on that, say she thought that it should have been canceled altogether, but that was not on the agenda. The board has not ever discussed and voted on whether they want to terminate that agreement. But right now we're in this moratorium period. Certainly okay. at any point I could put that back on the agenda and the board could decide whether they're going to want to continue it. Well, the so, fact so, but in other words, we agenda. do have a, uh, a motion that was voted on no, it wasn't the Culver it School District. No, it's Caroline. I'm talking about Culver School District, whereby I'm not I'm talking about us. I'm not interested in them. Charge us. Is that correct, Susan? I'm sorry if it was hard to hear my whole question. It was hard to hear your question. Uh, so, in other words, Culver voted 
not to charge us for six months. Correct. Right. So, so in the future, we could ask them if they would like to put it on their agenda, not to charge us for an additional six months, or if they want to agree to cancel it altogether, we could do that. But for right now, we're not paying them, which right. I think is great. Um, I, I'm glad okay, that can that I, was, Can I go uh, back to my question? Are you finished? Can I we go back can, to my question? Uh, Carolyn, if you'd like. Uh, my question is an agenda for the future. My question? No, 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 no. To, I'm, no, stop uh, already! You just rant. God, give me I, a break! I don't I'm, think I'm talking. Ranting. I think I'm. Yeah, you talking, are. No, you're trying I'm to trying cut into my to time. Address the matter that you. Can I please up. finish my question? And may uh, I as, please as long finish? As you let me finish my statement, Carolyn. Sure, go right ahead. Is, we can hour. put this on go a right future ahead. agenda. If no, you I'm would like to ask Culver to give us a longer extension, or if you want to ask Susan Lemke to try to negotiate a cancellation of the lease. So we could do that at our next meeting if you'd like to do that. That's not my question, and thank you for letting me speak. The reason I'm bringing this up is on the January agenda, it was supposed to be a discussion and then action. We did not vote to take any action as a board, but somebody took it upon themselves to take action. That's well, it was my the Culver point. School District. The Culver School no, District, I understand. Please stop. This board is responsible for the actions of this library. Well, this Carolyn, agenda item. Otherwise, we could continue paying them. If you want to continue so, you know, paying Culver, you're we off can in continue left field. I mean, is you're that what you want left us to field. do? Gosh, uh, I, I just don't understand. Please be quiet then. We had an agenda item quiet? that required that... action. Yeah, you're interrupting. All right. We had okay, an agenda we item have another that board required action. Who wishes to speak? And you Patty has it. got her hand up for a while. I'm not, why so did, no, no, I'm not finished. I, I why did you ignore the action? I am her a chance to speak. No, you have to Patty, answer my question. Patty, why did you uh, ignore what is your comment, action? Patty? Oh my gosh. My only question, and Carolyn, or excuse me, Carolyn, I don't think this is against what you're saying and any stretch. My concern is since there is a legal contract, do we have to do, is there some legal reason why we couldn't immediately, if we devoted on it, cancel it? Because some legal contracts have wordage in such a way, which I'm not a lawyer, I don't know, that might prevent that. Okay. I don't know. I see a couple of hands up, but I think Becky had her hand up next and then Linda. Yeah, I'm just wondering if this is actually something we should be talking about right now because it doesn't seem to be something that was on the treasurer's report for this month. And I'm also uh, remembering something that was just said about holding ourselves to a higher standard. And when you are disrespecting the president interrupt. of the board like that, I feel like that is... Oh, I'm sorry, did I mute myself? I think so. Sorry. Um, I was saying that I didn't think this was the proper time to be talking about this since it didn't pertain to the February financial documents and also that the, um, the tone of the conversation is really yeah. disrespectful. And I am Well, it's hard to talk with all of you interrupting me, but can I go back to my question? We well, do not no, have a chance. because Linda has not had a chance to speak yet. Sure, and let everybody talk and then I'll finish. So right Linda can speak next. Go ahead, Linda. It's okay. I was going to reiterate uh, basically what Becky was saying. I think we should watch our tone, stay respectful, and be respectful of each other. And again, um, I think this should be held at a different time to talk about this um, because we all have our opinions about the parking lot across the street, but this is not the time. Thank you. Okay. Fine. Thank you. I, I, I think uh, that's a now. good point. This is not something that comes under financial reports. Uh, we can discuss this uh, later in the meeting under other if you wish, although um, we, we're, it's not on our agenda to take action, but we can discuss it later. Uh, but right now, I think we ought to move ahead with the agenda. I need to restate my question, please, so it's clear for the record. I'm bringing up the fact that there is not a check for Culver on this month's check register or last month's. So I'm asking, how did that occur? 
at our January meeting on the agenda, it stated board of discussion regarding the agreement with school district 71 board of trustees on parking lease through June 30th with possible action. Now you can't take action unless you take a vote, but we didn't take a vote and somehow action has occurred. And the reason why it's fitting I bring this up is because it has to do with checks that are not in the check register. That's the point I'm trying to make. That was the answer I was looking for. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead. Um, under payment of the bills, do I have a motion to approve the operating expenses of $161,099.49, payroll expenses of $274,372.71 for a total monthly expense of $435,472.71. I have a motion from Patty and a second from Linda. All right, uh, any questions or comments regarding this motion? All right, may I then have a roll call, Cindy? Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Um, no, thank you. Becky? Yes. Diane? Yes. Five yeses, one no. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will move on then to the director's report and, and communications. I think we'll roll that into one. You'll talk about both of those, won't you, Susan? I don't know if we really have many communications. Yes. Happy um, so yeah, please, uh, please proceed with your report. Of course, we have much of your report in writing in our packet. Thank you very much for all that detailed information. You're but perhaps you'd like to add or elaborate upon your report. Um, well, I had emailed all of you, but I just want to say for the record that we were extremely happy to hear from the uh, Village of Niles that they have scheduled, they are planning to schedule the library workers and with the park district workers through the fire district's uh, program of doing vaccinations, which will be off at New Trier. And so uh, that has been a huge relief to the staff. And, um, you know, many of the staff that the staff that was a little bit older were able to get vaccinated a few weeks ago over at the village of Niles, um, the ones that live in the village. But um, but we were thrilled that they uh, gave us that priority and that it will really help us to uh, open up further. And so um, I also wanted to mention, in case you missed it, that a couple of you and other people over the years had said how confusing it was to call one of the library department's tech services when it had nothing to do with technology. And so um, we have now changed the name. Um, the staff came up with many good suggestions um, and they ended up deciding to call it materials services because um, everything that they do is to do with ordering library materials, cataloging them, processing them, inputting them, eventually weeding them when they are no longer useful. So they are now, I will try not to call them tech services. I have been calling them tech services my entire career. So that's going to be a little difficult, but, but we are going to try to start referring to it from now on as material services and probably the abbreviation would be MSD or department added on to that. So I hope that that is less confusing for you all. And I uh, have to the you. staff for some great, great suggestions that they came up with. Um, you would ask uh, for an update on our plans for, you know, going back a little more to normal. And so getting the staff vaccinated is really going to help with that. Um, having the COVID rate go down is also helping with that. Um, and having enough, you know, more of the community vaccinated and maybe, I don't know, probably a quarter of the staff is, is vaccinated at this point, or at least they've gotten their first shot. So uh, we have decided that on April 2nd, um, we are going to go from our four teams that we currently have, we're going to go down to two teams. So it'll basically be a week A and a week B. Um, that will allow us to switch up our hours a little bit. We'll have a little bit more staff available. Um, it doesn't change things hugely because the, the two teams were not, you know, it's not adding a ton of people together, but um, it will allow us to 
um, change our hours. I know that uh, one thing that we did hear in the survey is that patrons were becoming quite annoyed that we were closed for part, you know, during in the middle of the day that they, you know, that was inconvenient and confusing. So beginning April 2nd, we are gonna change our hours. We're gonna make them on, um, we're still gonna be opening a little bit later because we're finding people are not coming particularly early, but we will definitely monitor that, and monitor the response. But the plan right now is to move to a schedule of um, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday will be 10 to seven. Uh, Wednesday, we will add a late night. So we will be open to nine o'clock on Wednesdays. And then Saturday will be 10 to five. So that's what we're doing for now. Not planning on reopening on Sundays um, until fall, unless I get a lot of response from patrons saying that that's something that they really want. In the summer, uh, typically starting really in May, our Sundays were very light attendance anyway. So it seems like it'll be better to hold off on that. So we'll see. Did you have something, Karen? No, no, I just, I just think that great. I am so happy to hear that we're opening up a little bit. Today, yeah. I went inside the library for the first time. I walked <laughs> in the library, past the lobby. I walked down to the lower level. I, you know, I hadn't been anywhere in the library other than, you know, just inside the lobby there to pick up some books for, well, over a year. And, wow. Uh, wow. It, you know, it's just really, really great to see the opening up that we've been waiting for so long to, to start to happen. So yeah. uh, we wish you and the staff the best of luck in this okay. process. And, uh, you know, I know it's going to take some getting you used to, just as it took some getting used to closing down. So that that's fabulous. Yeah. Um, and so then that's just April. So then okay. um, at once the entire staff has been vaccinated and they've gotten through their two weeks after the second shot, um, which we estimate will be mid-May, then we will go from the two teams then to everybody working together. And so at that time, um, hopefully enough other people in the community also will be vaccinated that we will feel safe bringing out more furniture. Um, we still will be cautious with youth services because of course children will not be getting vaccinated right away. They, they are doing some testing on children now, so that's good, but, um, but we'll be a little bit more conservative with the children's department than with the rest of the library. But we, we will start restoring the furniture, start allowing people to use study rooms, um, things like that. So that should be coming up around, starting around mid-May. And then um, around mid-April, we're going to stop using, we're going to stop putting the books through the slot in the large meeting room door that, you know, Dave had come up with and it was really ingenious and it really solved the problem for us and we needed to quarantine. But since we're only quarantining 24 hours now and we have cleared the backlog on that, um, we're going to start using our sorter again so that people are getting a receipt right. that they have returned something and then we are able to change the status in the database to say recently returned so that they won't immediately be triggering the holds, which would have been a big problem. But um, that's what we're planning to do probably mid-April. And that way we can reclaim our uh, meeting room, which will be nice. Of course, we're using half of it for the election on April 6th anyway. And um, we're buying a few carts to help us with that. We've been renting carts all along up to this point. Now we're just gonna go ahead and buy six of those carts so we won't have to be renting anymore. And so we'll still have to quarantine for the 24 hours for as long as Rails requires that. But uh, as soon as they stop requiring that, we will get rid of the quarantine altogether. So that's, that is what I know about the plans. The um, programs will be mostly still virtual for a while. Um, they have big plans for summer reading. They've got all kinds of fun things planned. Some of it outside, they're gonna redo, do the chalk drawing on the, the wall again. And they, um, they're gonna do some yarn bombing on the front of the building and there'll be all sorts of fun things. So, uh, and then uh, we are planning to do a artwork contest uh, for all ages uh, to, uh, the, with the summer reading theme, which is reading colors your world. And they um, are going to, the, whoever wins the co that contest will get their their artwork as the cover of the next chapter one or the next newsletter for June, July. So, and then we'll put the artwork up to uh, promote summer reading during them. So um, gradually we'll start doing some hybrid programs where we have a few people in the building and then more people at home. Um, and, and I think that I don't think that Zoom programs will go away completely because I do find I think that some of our homebound people have really, really appreciated the opportunity to get to participate more in some library things. So mm -hmm. that's what we that's what we have planned for now. 
Um, I wanted to let you know that we have um, roofing bids have now gone out. I'm not sure what Mr. Yasso was referring to about scaring contractors away because um, we, our contractor that you guys hired is proceeding with that. So those were just published in the Niles Journal. It is on our website. So hopefully we'll get some good bids on those. We will not know the total cost of the roofing project until we get the bids and, and until those are all settled. And then last of all, I just wanted you to know for those of you that read the author Harlan Coben, um, our head of adult services was able to land him as a author working together with some other libraries. So on March 25th, I believe it is, he will be speaking and we didn't even have to pay anything for it. So that I'm is sorry, very, what did you say? we um, didn't even, we don't have to pay anything for it. And I believe it's the 25th. So, yeah, so that is very exciting. And that is all I had for you. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I can't remember if there are any communications that I should mention. Um, I'd just like to mention that you, uh, as usual, have a trustee calendar in here and it mentions some of the upcoming events. Um, and one of the things you have mentioned is the annual uh, American Library Association uh, conference in June. But, but Becky, um, you uh, also noticed that there are some seminars coming up uh, with the Illinois Library Association. Uh, is that correct? You'll, if, would you like to unmute yourself for a second yeah. and just uh, mention that because uh, some of our trustees may be interested in that too. Right. So they were offering a three-part series. You didn't have to go to all three. You could pick and choose um, between them. And the first one was this Saturday, I believe, the, the Saturday that just passed. Um, and there are two more, I think, one in April and one in May. So March, April, May. Um, and the last one in May is called Trustee Boot Camp. Um, so... I don't remember what the topic was for April, but I thought that they were all good and interesting and probably beneficial for all of us, even if we, you know, if you've already been on the board longer than me, it might be a refresher or maybe there's something new, but I thought it was a good opportunity. Okay, thank you for bringing that to our attention. All right, and also, any other questions uh, for Susan regarding her report? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that at the bottom of that calendar, I did put all of the budget and levy deadlines just so that you would have those because that's a, always a little hard to remember because it's, you know, sort of the second Tuesday after the fifth Monday of the third month. And so it, they, yeah. they can be a little bit complicated. So I just put that there. I'm just going to keep that at the bottom of the calendar so that you have an ongoing thing to refer to. Great. And then Thank as uh, communications, we did get a very nice uh, donation from a chapter of the DAR uh, for us to used toward genealogical things. So that great. was a communication. Great, great. Um, okay, so the next thing I see on the agenda is a presentation. I have of, some questions, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you didn't have any. Go ahead. Um, uh, let, I'll start with, Susan, you mentioned we're gonna go to two teams. Does that mean now the library is fully staffed or no? No, no, we- I mean, um, there's somebody everywhere? No, I'm sorry. Like that means there's somebody everywhere, right? It's not like there's departments where someone won't be there. It's no, the third floor, people, yeah. Right? We're not gonna be able to staff the third floor desk, uh, I think on that wave, I think that will have to wait till mid-May. So that will be a big thing is when we're finally able to really reopen the third floor. Yeah, we do, we're still really okay. running very much on a skeleton crew and um, okay. we have done a little bit well, I think we just really brought in some subs to help cover. We have a number of people out with medical issues not related to COVID on top of the fact that we have lost a number of people. I believe uh, I heard that um, patron services is down some hundred hours right now. So when we wow. really start getting more busy, we are definitely going to need to hire a little bit more. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I don't understand the team system. I know you explain it, but I don't, I can't picture what it really means, but thank you for that. And then as far as the vaccinations, are all employees eligible to get them? So all, everyone can go, there's no restrictions, like they're not age or anything. They can all get a vaccine, right? No, we're in a category, like the teachers were all allowed to be vaccinated at a certain time. So they're oh, all the park district workers and all of the library workers. Wonderful. That's wonderful. I wasn't, I mean, it sounded too good to be true, but yeah, no that's kidding. wonderful. Glad to hear that. Okay, then I have some true questions. Okay, I noticed, uh, let's see. Um, there's a series of museum tours, which sounds really incredible. And it said it's through partnership with area libraries. Does that mean that it takes 
but it's it's virtual. So what's the partnership with other libraries mean? I don't think I understand that aspect of it. Yeah. We're doing a lot more of that lately where one library um, brings, they have an idea for a program like the Harlan Coben program or many times mm -hmm. the author programs. But in this case, it was, there's, there's a group that's called Pulse and they do adult programs and they share ideas with each other. And so lately, um, it, because people aren't coming in person and it isn't located at one library, you can share a virtual thing. And so you can split the costs up. You can split the oh, cost of the okay. Zoom licensing, things like that. So that's what the partnership means. So yeah, they've been doing a lot more of that and we'll okay. be getting some great programs that way. That very, very good cost. This is, well, this museum tour is awesome. I mean, it that actually, it was a, it was something I was thinking of when the when COVID first hit and they all closed. And I thought, God, wouldn't it be nice if we could just sit home and watch them, you know? <laughs> but okay, so that's wonderful. Thank you for that. And then, um, oh, back to our new materials service department or yeah. materials. All right, I was looking at the numbers again. And I just know, and I don't see the page, but I did type it up. Okay, so we have an ordered amount, a received amount, and an input. And what I noticed is um, the input amount is about 4,000 higher than what we ordered and 5,000 higher than what we received. And I was wondering what would account for that? Um, I have not added it all up um, myself, so I don't know exactly what the difference is, but some of it was probably just clearing a backlog. It, it is very, very empty down there right now, so they definitely have gotten a bunch of stuff out of there. So input is the last thing that happens when something moves out the door. Cindy, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Because Cindy oversees that department. Um, I think you have to sort of factor in the time that it takes for certain materials to go through the process, some are faster than others. And so it's, it uh, doesn't really track, you know, by adding up the columns because there's always material that is still in the department, materials from where you're starting at the top, there were materials there before the columns begin. So it, um, just adding up those columns, it's not gonna ever sort of come out even because it's a very so fluid, flowing process. I understand. I understand. Okay. Um, what I expected to find was that the input was lower thinking, you know, it takes longer. That's the hardest part of it all. But it, when it was higher, I thought, wow, I don't understand. But that makes sense because your, your graph, I think maybe it started in July and some of these items could have been hanging around since May. So I could see how that would happen. All yeah, right. That makes a, sense. A huge that my order only that came in in June. So that I saw I, that actually, was that the 80,000 or I don't know, it was yeah. monstrous. You had pictures of it or something? Right. Yeah, right. I remember that. Okay, well, I, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, all right. Um, the next thing, thing on our agenda is the presentation of patron survey results. Uh, Susan, would you start refreshing our memories as to when this survey was, when it took place, how it took place, what it was serving, and so forth? Yes. Hold on. Okay, so I think I included most of your possible questions in the presentation here. So we did a survey running. We, I sent the link out on February 4th, 2021, and uh, we concluded it on March 8th to get to have it closed in time to be able to report on it at this meeting. Um, we received 205 surveys total, uh, you know, and, and in another time, we would have hoped to have gotten a few more, but I think, um, you know, that was not a bad number for a COVID epidemic. 160 of them were from the district, um, 56 of them were in print, and 149 of them were online surveys. So whenever you get a lot that are online, that's always going to shape your results a little bit because it's the people replying online obviously know how to use computers and are going to be, you know, and, and also you inherently have the question of this was all in English. So you're only pretty much going to get the English speaking people answering it. Um, so the first question I asked is what's your zip code? Because I wanted to be able to tell who was answering the questions and I wanted to be able to filter out the people who do not live in our district. 
because it's interesting to see what they have to say, but they are not who we're serving. And so I wanted to really focus on our district. So we got 130 of the answers came from the village of Niles. We had 24 from unincorporated Des Plaines and six from unincorporated Glenview. And then I looked at the zip, other zip codes we got, and these were the other communities that we had them from. The, the ones in Chicago were primarily Edison Park and Edgebrook. We got quite a few from Park Ridge. I don't think they've opened as fully as we have yet. Uh, and we got quite a few from Morton Grove and a couple from Skokie. So everything that comes from this point on, the results are not from the 205, they're only from the 160 of the district. So I also asked the demographic question, what age group are you? So just we get a sense of who it was that was answering. I think you can see that, you know, as with many things, we got a, more of the seniors replying than most other people, but I was pretty happy with the 18 to 39 responses that we got. That was actually pretty good. Um, only a few people refused to answer that. Uh, I also asked what languages were spoken at home. And so these don't add up because almost everybody that answered this uh, had English as one of the answers and then they added another language onto it. Because as I said, this, you know, this survey was in English. So it's primarily going to get answers from English speaking. Um, our top one was Spanish at eight. We got seven Polish. I was surprised to see the four German. I had not realized that we had a lot of German speaking people. And I actually checked to see if they were like all from the same household, but they were not. They were, they all came in at different times and had different IP addresses. Um, we had um, three Gujarati, three Hindi and three Urdu, which are all Indian languages. And then we got yeah. one from that was Telugu, which is another Indian language. So uh, getting together, we actually got the most response from people um, from, with an Indian background. Um, and then we had a few Romanian, Greek, Arabic, Tagalog, which is the Philippines and Korean, and then one each of these other languages. So that was just interesting. So one of the questions that we asked was, which are the best ways for you to get information about the library services and programs? And it was choose all that apply so you could click more than one thing. So we had, um, 20% said they wanted, they, they like to get it in print every two months. So that was 20%. 37% said that they like to get it by email, and that's a weekly email. Bear in mind, again, this, many of the results were from the online users. It was an online survey, so they were, of course, going to be comfortable with that. And then 47%, or almost half of them, said what they would like is both print and email, which is what we're currently doing. And then um, I just was curious if people were using uh, the collections evenly. And you can see from this that um, people still really like their books and, in hardcover and paperback. Uh, the ebook response, I think, came up much higher than it would have in previous years. Um, e audiobooks, a little bit less so. The books on CD and playaways did not get as many people liking them, although it's still about a quarter of the people that responded said they still do like to use those. Um, and one of the staff members, when I ran through this at the staff meeting today, said that she sees a lot of people checking those out. She wondered if people that check things out on CDs and playaways don't have time to fill out surveys. So I thought that was an interesting approach. She figures yeah. Susan, can I ask a quick question just sure. about that? Sure. When you say books on CD, are those when you get a CD and it's an audio book? It's an audio or? book. Yes. So those are really a different form of audio book than the E. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's what typically people have been checking out for the last 15 or so years is books on CD. But I think that maybe more than some of the other formats has moved more thoroughly over to streaming and people get, you know, that's what Overdrive is as well. So they're using them as eBooks these days. Um, so, you know, but everything got some support. Everybody, I was actually kind of expecting people to poo-poo getting video games and they actually did pretty well. It was almost 30% for kids and 25% for adults. So uh, every format got some support and this, then this one was equipment to check out. And then here's a little bit of a different way of looking at that. You can see it as a line graph where you can see here's books up here. Everybody thinks we should still have books. Thank goodness. But um, here are the other things, just you can kind of see how they look relative to each other. But everybody, everything still got some love. Um, and under other, the responses were things like large print, um, which, you know, is fine. It's, that was included in the hardcovers. But 
Um, and I, I did leave out one category completely. It, I just missed it. Nobody mentioned it though. And that was music CDs. So I thought that was interesting. I, maybe people have really moved to streaming for that. Um, so the next question was a very long one. And so the graph here just kind of gives you a visual idea of what the answers came in as. It says, we know that the pandemic has changed life for many of us. and We are trying to identify how the library can help you. What are you, your neighbors, and your community going to need for the next two years? And so this was trying to get some idea in terms of some form of strategic planning of what we should be focusing our efforts on. So um, you could see that, you know, nothing got less than, you know, 14.19 is the lowest ranking thing. Every single thing on here got some people thinking that we should be putting attention on it. Um, so the, this is the lowest category here is with citizenship information, library materials in other languages, classes for English language learners. And so you can see there's kind of a theme here where people are not particularly supporting the idea of having materials and services for people that, for whom English is not their first language. But again, it was primarily English speaking people that took the, took the survey. Um, opportunities for civil conversation with people I might disagree with got almost 20%, which is actually frankly better than I expected. And then connection with people in a similar situation got 21%. Um, and assistance with government and employment applications. I put that in because we're getting requests like that mm -hmm. down in um, down in the on the tech floor. Uh, so the next range here, where there was some interest in it, these are it's everything over twenty five percent. Were opportunities to learn practical skills that will help me get a new or better job, access to financial tools like Morningstar and Value Line, library materials delivered to me digital tools for recording, editing, designing, and innovating, opportunities to safely interact socially, opportunities for my children to work on particular skills such as writing or math, and opportunities to build equity, diversity, and inclusivity within our community, which got 30%. So I was happy to see that. And that is something Carolyn and I actually were talking about that a little bit. Yeah. So we're going to um, be looking on how ways that we can move forward with that. And I should say at this point, I meant to say earlier, you will get all of these results in print. You will get not just the things I am highlighting, but you'll get the whole survey results in print so that you'll be able to go through it at your leisure. So this is just some highlights. Um, the next range of things. So I, th I think some of these things were sort of niche things where like it wasn't everybody saying they wanted it, but a significant portion of people were interested in it. Then we had the significant interest Things, ways to try expensive equipment like a 3D printer or a video camera without purchasing it, family or multi-age programs and events, creativity tools and instruction, a place to take children without spending money, activities for children that foster learning and literacy, ways to help mm -hmm. households save money by borrowing or streaming instead of buying, staff to answer my questions using unbiased, reliable information sources, free online courses to build skills through lynda.com, Gale courses, or staff taught, and access to technology equipment, such as the printer, internet scanning, and faxing. Mm -hmm. So uh, by, um, you know, 35% of the people, 34% like at, was at the bottom of this range. This is a lot of the things having to do with the library being able to save people money, which I think is definitely going to be important to people over the next couple yeah. of years as they've taken a financial hit. So any way that we can give them things that they can use for a little while, and but they don't need permanently, that's gonna be a way that we can be helpful. It's something that we currently do, but we need to keep really letting people know that that's available. Several people put down um, under the comments that they wanted to borrow um, sewing machines, and we already do allow people to check out sewing machines. So we just have to sometimes get better at telling people what we have. And then the most interest, the highest one, which is 50% and up, uh, was sort of more inspirational. It was people thinking sort of more about what the library means to them in some ways. The, what they want from the library in the next couple of years is ways to expand my perspective through reading, viewing, or programs. They want technology instruction, how to use software tools or equipment. They want information that they know is accurate. They want inspiration to try or learn new things. And they want programs that are interesting, entertaining, or informative. And the number one thing that they want is the chance to get books, music, and DVDs, et cetera, from other libraries, which I think yeah. um, 
it should make you feel good about the money that we spend on CCS because that is how we place all those holds and we receive all of those materials and we have those partnerships with all those libraries where we are sharing our things and they are sharing their things with us and everybody benefits that way. So that was the number one thing. So then I had a series of statements, which was, which of these statements do you agree with? Check all that apply. And so this is just a visual representation of it. And it had a little bit more of a range to it. So here are the full questions. Um, uh, the, the highest ranking one here is having a good library reflects on the community. They agreed with that statement. 142 of the people said that. The library is the place in the community where all ages and types of people are welcome. The library provides continuous lifelong learning opportunities. The library provides a place for children and or teens to get together safely. And then I had a, a series of questions that's more about their kind of current experience with the library. I have been frustrated that I can't spend time at the library because of the pandemic. And it, it's, a, it's quite a few people, but it's a good drop from some of the more positive statements here. So 50% said that, but it was 75% on the last one. I like being able to stream and download books and movies when the library is closed was also 50%. And I wish I had more time to use the library. Yeah. And then I asked questions about the value of the library to people. And so um, I put the most negative possible thing. I don't use the library and I don't think it's necessary in this day and age. And only two people agreed with that statement. Then um, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that there are definitely going to be some people that are concerned about their taxes. And I wanted to see where they prioritized that. Oops, sorry. Uh, I said, I like the library, but I am worried about my taxes. And that was 10% of the reply. The people replying said that but a whopping 80% of people said the library is an excellent value. So I was very happy with that result. That is exactly what we are trying for all the time to make those tax dollars work for people to their benefit. So remember, these are all residents that are asked that answered these questions. So then I'm gonna run super quickly through some of the comments that we got. Um, this first one is, some of the negative comments that we got. It's actually almost all of the negative comments that we got because I didn't want anybody to feel like I was hiding any of the negative things that we got. So I'm gonna run through these, the comments. It will take uh, about five minutes, so bear with me here. Uh, aim for, try to aim for more transparency with the community to minimize the distrust that some have. Spending mm -hmm. must be, you know what, I have to close this. Okay, spending must be reviewed and necessary Spending on cosmetic niceties for the building must be verified and put to bid. Our tax dollars are not an open, unlimited wallet. What for? It is a place for books and computers, not to teach diversity. I wish the book collection was larger. I frequently have to go to other local libraries to get books I want. Cut out the excess. The library tends to spend too much money. There are more seniors that live in Niles and survive on social security. They can't afford the tax increases that the library bestows on them. Also during a pandemic, there are those that who, who have lost their jobs and have no income. It is not right for the library to spend for unnecessary things. The library thinks it is business as usual and does not care what the residents think. And now ahead, uh, it seems like a more minor point. I don't think we need so many cookbooks. Let's limit cookbooks to a smaller number. <laughs> Very specific. <laughs> Libraries should do more to attract millennials. And I went back and checked and that was in fact the millennial that said that. Um, the library has offered enough technology programs, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, along with the resume writing. There needs to be fun things to keep up with the times. For example, how to cook in an Instapot. Oddly enough, the person that said this also was one of the two people that said they don't use the library and they don't think it should happen anymore. So I don't know how those two <laughs> fit together. It's puzzling. <laughs> the library treats its patrons like dirt. What a waste of our tax money. This was a gentleman, I'm sure, who is mad that we don't let him in the library to use the bathroom when it's closed. Don't overreach. The library is not qualified to be a social worker. Mm. And then, uh, then we have some more positive comments. I would think that the recent honors of being one of the finest libraries in the U.S. would not make this survey necessary. Keep up the wonderful work. Computer lab is superb, clean, organized, easy access. 
wonderful staff, love the library. So happy I am able to come inside. I think a good library is good for everyone in the community. I am proud to call this library mine. I enjoy the programs, adult and children and the craft projects the library provides. I love the helpful staff and variety of materials and equipment. Very well run library. Don't know what I would do without the outreach program whose staff is helpful, kind and professional. This is true of all library staff. The reading program last summer was very helpful. It got me through part of the pandemic isolation by giving me something else to do and think about. A good, well-equipped library is good for the community. I truly appreciate remote access to resources even when the library is able to open. I know there is a vocal minority of people who seem to not appreciate the library. I greatly value the work that our librarians and other staff do for the community and I'm glad that everyone has access to the resources the library offers. Thank you. You guys are doing an awesome job. Keep doing theme-based story times and some fitness sessions for women. Love the makerspace. Taxes to support the library are minimal, de minimis, and thus should not be compromised. Keep being proactive and innovative. The benefits will always outweigh the cost. The information on checkout receipts that gives total amount saved by using library services is very informative. We more than get our money's worth. The library is the community's access to key elements of life beyond and world information. It's the WTTW window to our world here in Niles and it serves us very well in that important capacity. I love that one. We have a great library that provides for all the various needs in our community. The staff is knowledgeable and happy to help. We have great craft projects which give us an opportunity to try different activities. Also many and varied programs on a variety of topics. It is a real bargain. Keep up the great work, best use of my tax dollars. This is the best library. I love the staff, the variety of books, movies, video games, and entertainment. Library is a must in the community, happy to pay taxes. All of you doing good job for our community and children. God bless all of you. I can't imagine life without access to a good public library. I love to read and couldn't begin to afford to buy the 100 plus books I read in a year, courtesy of the Niles Main Library, not to mention all the trees that would be cut down if we all had to buy individual books instead of sharing through the library. Thank you for the wonderful Niles Main Library. I think the library is a wonderful service. Here's the last one. Uh, and I like the contrast between the first one and the middle one here. I have lived in Niles for almost two years and I am very, very happy with the Niles Library. Everyone is very helpful and friendly. I am always greeted with a cheerful hello. The selection of books and movies is awesome. I think the library is a wonderful source of information. I have been using the library for the past 60 years. So we had two years and 60 years. I have come to know a lot of people working at the library and they are all fabulous. <laughs> and last of all, the library's pandemic response has been incredible. I have been using Libby, Canopy and Hoopla and I'm very happy with these services. I appreciate that the district abated property tax dollars back to residents in light of the pandemic and glad that this library has been a good steward of tax dollars. Thank you. So uh, just to remind you that was based on 160 responses. Obviously that is just a sliver of uh, the population, uh, but it gives us a little glimpse into what people are thinking and what they care about. So it gives us a little bit of guidance moving forward to help us plan and, and come up with a, a plan for the future. It's um, not a full-fledged survey, but it's a, you know, we had really wanted to get out into the community and interview people and do focus groups. And that was just not possible at this time, but at least it gives us something to start on since our strategic plan is almost over with. So that's what we have. And again, I will be giving you all of those results. Susan, um, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll give everyone a chance to ask a question if they like, but I, I just wanted to, um, say, I'm glad you mentioned at the very end of your talk right now, the next strategic plan, because I think this survey really, you know, it's, it's just interesting and valuable on its own, but it's something that really feeds into, and I think should assist us in creating the next strategic plan. And I, this is the type of information uh, and data that I think we'll want to be looking at. So, um, if we can uh, refresh some of our members uh, memories, and some people, uh, well, Becky may, may not know this, so we do have a strategic plan. And Susan, when, are, when do you think we're due to look at that again, to now, review our plan? 
Well, you know, we had started talking about it back at the beginning of the pandemic. We had been getting ready to hire a consultant to help us with it. So we're way behind on it, really. But this actually, that's a good thing, I think, in a way, because if we had just done a strategic plan and then the pandemic hit, that would have been, we would have been just going, we had this great plan and now we don't get to do any of it. So now it's actually the perfect time to have gone back to the community to say, what do you think you're going to need? And, um, and be able to start basic building a plan on that. And I think that for the next one, I will recommend doing one that is a, a more limited plan, not a full-blown strategic plan, but something that gives us a, a way to kind of guide what we're doing for the next couple of years and then do a more full-fledged one once we kind of see, once things have settled out from the pandemic a little bit better. That's my recommendation anyway. Okay, all right. Well, we have a little time to think about that. Uh, but uh, all right, does anyone have any questions um, about the presentation we've just seen or uh, comments that they want to make at this point? No. Oh, Carolyn? Yes, Susan, um, usually, um, surveys are the basis of our strategic plan. And with us being in the middle of a pandemic, do you see us probably putting together a more thorough type of survey or survey so we can get more information before we jump into our strategic plan? Well, I think if there are particular areas that the board is interested in knowing more about, we definitely can ask people specific questions about specific things. Um, if there are the different areas that you felt like didn't really get addressed here, I was really just trying to get a general sense of what people thought the needs were going to be post-pandemic. And of course, nobody can really entirely predict that because we just don't sure. know how the economy is going to recover. So I think there's room for doing some more surveying. But um, one of the consultants I was working with doesn't place a huge value on surveying people anyway. I think it's important to communicate with the community in any case. But um, yeah, we definitely could do more, but I don't know if we can do a lot more than we just did because um, I think there are particular areas of information where we could go much more into detail, like, I, I don't know, more, uh, more, hear more about what they think about programs or something like that. Um, so this was definitely an overview. And if the board wanted to focus more tightly on some particular area, we definitely could do that. Well, I was okay. just thinking about the numbers, print, print surveys. So were those on in um, chapter one? Is that how the print came about? It wasn't coming into the library, right? It, it was coming into the library, yeah. So those were really the, the people, yeah, we got 56 by people coming into the library. And I believe Outreach wow. took a, a few out as well. Okay. The homebound. All right. All right. I was just thinking if we would open up soon and there were more people, just the people who come in the library, I'd like to get their thoughts. I mean, yeah. one, what is it, 160 out of like 30 to 50,000 people. I, it's kind of, I think it's small, but um, we'll see what happens as time progresses. Yep. All right, thank you. Okay, anyone else? All right, um, thank you very much, Susan. It's interesting, and uh, I also appreciated all the graphs and everything. It just makes it a little bit more visual presentation. Um, but I like the comments, too. They're sort of fun to read. Yeah, um, yeah. So, well, there anyway. are lots more of those. Okay, all right. Um, so we have one more. Well, um, we have under number 10, we have another item uh, regarding moving the board to award a contract. Um, I'd like to uh, ask if anyone would like a motion would like to make a motion to this effect, um, and then we can discuss it. Do, so, do I have a motion to move the library board of trust? Uh, wait. I'll make a motion. Do I have a motion to award a contract for fifty-seven thousand seven hundred sixty-three dollars and seventy-four cents to <laughs> Midcore Incorporation for the acquisition and installation of Mittel Voice Over Internet Protocol replacement? phone system. I see that Linda's making that motion. Is there a second? And that second is made by Patty. So we do have this on the floor. Um, perhaps, uh, is there any information that uh, you would like to provide to us other than what we already have in writing here? We do have a, a statement on page 38 that describes this, but uh, is there something any either one of you would like to add, either Susan, Greg, uh, Cindy, I don't know if this is something that you worked on, but 
uh, but this is Rich's project, so we are going to have him speak to it. Oh, Rich, I'm, I'm sorry, I just saw you there. there. I apologize. I didn't notice you until right I just, now. Yeah, I just brought him in. I just that appeared. <laughs> is that, are you really in the library, or is that a virtual background? It's a virtual background uh, available on Facebook. Uh, our <laughs> publicity and marketing team put together uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, and I thought it was uh, nice and appropriate. Very appropriate. I, I thought you actually could have been sitting in the aisle of the library there for a minute. But, but the only reason I know is it's light outside in your virtual background. Right. So that was a clue. Anyway, Rich, okay. <laughs> Um, go ahead, Rich. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to the board. And, uh, you know, uh, I would like to wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, and apologize for any kind of background noise because I am at home and I'm on double duty tonight with Julia here uh, as she appears through the virtual background when she gets close enough to the camera. So, um, it's, yeah. It's so magic. She appears and disappears. It is magic, isn't it? She loves it. So. It's I'm one sorry. of the benefits of this um, Zoom and vi virtual conferencing that, uh, you know, period of time that we're living in. You. Yes, you can sit with me. So um, as some of you have been able to, and hopefully everyone has the, uh, had the ability to take a look uh, previously um, at the motion and the new business recommendation action, um, our current phone system um, is about, a, is actually just over 11 years old. Um, so We've utilized it uh, pretty thoroughly. Um, even during the pandemic, we've had uh, resources that were uh, made available to us through virtualization, well, through remote access and through uh, use of cell phones that uh, staff had at home and that the phone system was able to transfer. But it's designed as a server client model, uh, which most phone systems are, uh, but it requires that there's a PBX box, a physical box in the back, and it's no longer uh, able to be serviced. Um, it's end of service life by NEC, uh, which is the manufacturer. And what that means is basically that um, as uh, was indicated in the memo, the last time we had a major issue with regards to uh, the back end of the system, uh, I had to go on eBay and I had to get parts and uh, be able to kind of put it together. So it's a very difficult situation to have a system, uh, a business system, business phone system, where at any time, you know, we're, we don't have support on it. It can uh, malfunction and then we lose our phones. Um, and there's really nothing that we can do to correct it without going out and procuring a new one. So um, we've been looking at this for a little bit of time. Um, we, last time, uh, 11 years ago, we went out to bid. Uh, so we did that ourselves and, um, uh, we were able to procure this existing phone system the last, again, 11 years. Uh, this time we took advantage of uh, group consortial uh, government uh, contracts that are available, that are awarded, they're pre-bid. Um, the memo indicated uh, that the one that we settled on, with, uh, which is Sourcewell, uh, is one of the uh, several that the state procurement office uh, endorses uh, for our uh, government institutions such as ourselves as a special district uh, take advantage of so we don't have to go through and create the bidding um, documents and go all through all that when that's already done. And it's also done on a larger scale. So, uh, you know, we're a small library. Um, we have a small amount of budget um, comparatively to a cooperative and a collective uh, type of organization, government organization, so they can get much better pricing. Um, and so what we're, uh, what we're here tonight to request is that uh, we, uh, that the board approve a uh, replacement phone system that's pre-bid uh, for that price, the $57,000. We went and we uh, extensively communicated with the different departments and administration to review and make sure that what we are getting is uh, what is uh, for the need of the library, uh, that it's not going to be um, jeopardizing what existing services uh, the phone system is providing. Um, and it's newer technology, it's 11 years later. Um, so our existing technology was a digital technology. This is a voice over IP, meaning we're gonna be able to uh, utilize the network as opposed to the voice network, uh, the older lines that were installed, oh, back in 1996 in the building. Um, so that's a good thing because uh, the data network has been uh, progressively upgraded as uh, 
the years went on and certainly uh, quite extensively uh, at the last construction. And so all these things will you know, be able to uh, allow us to utilize this new phone system for another 10 years. Um, and so we broke it down uh, in the memo in terms of kind of give you an idea of the costs and what that means. Um, because it is a lot of money um, and you know, we wanna make sure that we spend it appropriately and correctly. Um, one thing I will tell you is um, sometimes people kind of compare it to like a consumer uh, phone or uh, perhaps maybe one or two telephones in a small business. Um, we're a pretty extensive library beyond that type of small business environment where it's maybe, you know, half a dozen phones. Um, utilizing a PBX box or a, a phone system type of setup uh, is a great savings of money. Uh, just to give you an idea, the state of Illinois has a contract with uh, AT&T for plain old telephone lines. That contract uh, provides basically it's $90 for every single telephone line. Uh, businesses pay anywhere up to about $150 for lines uh, with taxes. Um, so if you would imagine, you know, $90 times the phones that we have, uh, that's a very expensive bill per year. It's like over $100,000. So in order to not have that kind of um, exposure for just the service, um, we have digital telephone lines. It's a circuit. It provides us with a number of simultaneous connections. And that uh, gives us the ability to dramatically decrease that uh, that cost per year. It's somewhere about six six thousand five hundred dollars for our voice services. In order to do that, we bring in the technology that the phone company has and offers to people directly to their homes or to small businesses. We bring that technology inside, and that's what we're talking about. We're we're talking about a phone system that uh, allows us to save on the service costs that uh, we would otherwise have to if we were directly you know, plugging in a, a phone that you would you know, buy off the shelf and, um, and use maybe at home. So any questions for me or Julia, I guess? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Julia is offering to answer questions. Um, I, I do have just a couple and I, I do wanna give the other board members a chance also. And I just want to understand how this, this works. So I understand that under the Government State Purchasing Act, uh, libraries and other governmental uh, entities can purchase through this system, whereby using sort of the uh, large buying power, of, buying power of many government uh, entities, there are um, companies that have already placed bids and have been selected because their bids are good and that, that process has already been done. I'm not saying this very well, but I, I think that's sort of how it works. So what I'm not quite understanding is middle, middle business system is actually providing the, the, phone, the phone system. Is that right? So um, you're, you're very, you know, right down the middle uh, with regards to being accurate on it. Um, Sourcewell in this particular case is yeah. a government institution, government agency out of uh, Minnesota that's so, solely um, authorized to do procurement uh, for members, which are, as you indicated, government, special government agencies, uh, districts like park districts, school districts, uh, library districts. Uh, there's 60,000 members, so that's where that joint large group uh, uh, type of bid um, presence uh, helps in terms of the, the, the lowering of any kind of bid uh, that is uh, any proposal. Uh, this particular bid went out in uh, two 2019, so it's a relatively newer um, uh, RFP that went out. Uh, Mitel Business Systems was awarded um, there was four awards of which Mitel, as we had indicated in the, uh, the memo, um, uh, came out with the number one ranking. They were also the only manufacturer, uh, direct manufacturer that was awarded. So uh, the other companies were just uh, integrators. So they were reselling services from perhaps a different manufacturer. Um, and uh, Mitel has partners, uh, local partners that are the integrators. And so Mitel is that local partner, uh, I'm sorry, Midco, Midco is the local partner that is going to be the integrator in this case. 
Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, which I'm twins? At Midco and my, my talent. Yeah, it's very similar names. I could it help? Could it be helped? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, did you say Sourcewell is actually a government agency? It is a government agency. It's uh, it's elect has elected trustees, and you know all the documentation with regards to their meetings, the RFP process. They're basically sort of like our say we're a public library district uh, for the Niles Main District that area. Um, mm -hmm. They're a uh, a government agency in the state of Minnesota that's specifically designed to do procurement. So that's all they do. Uh, they specialize okay. in this and so they, they specialize- the agency, they do the procurement. Yes. They get these bids. But in, in the memo here, I was a little confused because it says towards the bottom, it says Sourcewell was awarded a contract which began in April of 2019 and expand, expires in April of 2023. So I wasn't, I was sort of confused. What contract is Sourcewell getting? I I believe it's Sourceful awarded a contract. So it's the past tense and it's meaning that they awarded oh. a contract on behalf of Sourcewell, which is the membership okay. of the consortia, which we are a member of. Okay, so Sourcewell awarded the contract to- Mitel Business Mitel, Systems. Is that correct? Yes. Mitel, Mitel, okay. Mitel, right. yes. Okay. All right. Um, so for the $57,000, we're getting the actual phone system and they're installing it too. Is that right? Yes. Uh, including five years right. of support with regards to software updates, firmware updates, um, and one year of replacement on the hardware. Uh, the only hardware in this particular situation will be the actual phones. Um, and you know, from doing this for a number of years, uh, specifically, with regards to phone systems, we've had two phone systems over the course of the last 21 years. Um, and those those phones last, you know, 10 years for sure. Okay, and about how many phones do we have? Uh, we have 87 phones. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you for answering all my questions, Rich. And I'm sorry Absolutely. if the other board member has been waiting patiently, perhaps you have some questions too uh, about this uh, contract. We're not. Um, okay. Oh, Patty. Yeah. Patty I was just going to uh, say uh, thank you for being so, I don't know, with you, you know, giving us so much information because the questions I had, it was like you anticipated them and answered them before I could formulate them. Thank you. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Becky? Yeah, I it was something similar. I was just going to say that the, the memo was really, really, really great. Um, I, I am appreciative of the fact that you guys did a lot of research on this and that you were able to find um, someone to work with that has a lot of bargaining power, therefore bringing the, the cost down a lot. Um, I also am familiar with the MyTel system myself and it works quite well. And there's a lot of options um, for staff to be able to use that makes things a lot easier doing your job. So that's positive. Oh, do you have that at uh, your office perhaps? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good to know yeah. that someone uh, is familiar with it directly and it works yeah. for them. Okay. Uh, Linda, do you have your hand up? No, no, you just had a, the digital, the little hand on the screen. I didn't know if that's oh, what you meant. Sorry. Um, no, no, it's okay. Yeah. I, I, I just did that. Linda. The only thing I wanted to say is thank you, Karen, for asking how many phones because that kind of puts, you know, reality on it. It's like, wow, that's yeah. a, lot a lot of phones. A lot of phones. <laughs> right. A right. lot of transferring, a lot of connections, a lot of numbers. Um, and uh, and that's how we connect with our, with our community. So yeah. thank you very much. Right. It, it is a complicated system, um, so there's a lot of programming that went into the existing system. Um, I was trained in it, uh, thankfully, back when we had installed uh, it 11 years ago, so I was able to, con I've been able to continue to maintain it without having uh, service come in and, and do installations of additional phones and whatnot. Uh, to give you an idea, the 87 phone footprint has been uh, a steady constant uh, since the uh, renovation uh, a number of years ago. Um, so we're, we're maintaining that and we're not expanding and we're trying to make sure that it's accurate. Uh, you know, one of the things you have to realize at, 
a 60,000 square foot facility um, with a, you know, a good, I think, I, I, maybe Susan or Greg know specifically the number, but I would estimate about maybe 60% of the library building or more is patron facing with meeting rooms and service desks. And just for public safety, uh, you need phones in rooms in order to be able to make emergency calls. Um, and I know the, the, the staff and uh, the patrons, even in some cases where, uh, you know, there has been an emergency, have been appreciative of the fact that they had access to that, even in a day and age that cell phones are prevalent, so. Patty. I have a question. Oh, oh uh, I was going to say. Up and Diane, then I'll call on you, okay? Is that all right? Okay. Patty? Well, I can after, I can talk after. I'm fine. Okay, Diane. Okay. All right. My question is, is uh, just wondering uh, when will you do this, and how long does it take for you to complete such a huge project? Uh, so, uh, to the staff and to the patrons, it will be done overnight, and there will be no downtime whatsoever that anyone will experience. Ah. So that's that's the answer that we like to provide, right? <laughs> uh, on the back end, it's going to be several months of uh, going through and making sure that we have the right configuration. This is a new phone system. It's 11 years newer than our existing, so it's going to provide for um, a better way of configuring it, which uh, basically means that, you know, on the back end, it's a little bit more work to figure out, okay, what do we have now and how do we make sure that the MUFO system does it exactly the way we need it to work and what enhancements can it do? Um, so after about maybe a two month period, we also have to order the phones and program them, uh, which IT services will be doing. Um, we'll make the switch over. Um, we'll also have training for the staff so that you know they're prepared. They're not gonna be, you know, one might kind of question, well, it's a phone. What do you need to prepare for? Um, you know, um, as some of the staff or some of the board members know who have um, experience with business phone systems, there are a number of, uh, you know, basic functions that everybody can figure out how to do. Uh, but there are more advanced functions, uh, hunt groups, how to be able to assist someone that might be at a service desk and they're on a phone and you're trying to uh, help and answer the phone in a back area. Uh, and provide them with information. So um, we'll make sure that the staff have training uh, and they're prepared for the switch. And then, like I said, overnight, we'll do a switch over, uh, replace all 87 phones with these new phones. Um, and, and then we'll continue follow up to make sure that the configuration that we've programmed is appropriate and is working correctly. Uh, you know, this includes all the night uh, features, the call attendant features uh, so that, uh, Whoever calls in, uh, a patron, you know, resident, uh, can be able to get uh, through the phone system, uh, through the automated phone system, uh, just as easy as being able to reach somebody to get assistance. Thank you. That's great. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyone else? Oh, Patty, did did you have a question? Yeah, just a couple of comments. Uh, my husband was a phone engineer engineer for the phone companies. And so I have experienced what he says. Majority of the work is done ahead of time and it's done one night, snap and it's, it's the system's up. Um, but as far as the emergency stuff, I've used it myself a couple of times for Code Adam. It's very important to have phones everywhere that, so they can be used. Thank yes. you. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, any other, uh, Carolyn, Carolyn. Yes, um, Rich, I was wondering, um, it's a completely different system than what we have now. Are there any data upgrades that you're gonna have to um, take care of before you even um, have the system delivered or, or the parts delivered and having it up and running? I mean, I guess we're a lot older where we are now than where we're going to. So I was wondering- Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So, um, you know, I, I, I'll, Somebody time me to keep me down to five minutes or less because, you know, uh, I have a tendency to go into a lot of detail about technical stuff. So um, what we're going to be able to do is be able to plug the new phones into the network connections that the computers are connected to. Yes. Everyone. Yeah, they're, wa they're waiting for my answer. Oh, okay. And so what happens is... Um, 
so that night, we're, we'll unplug all the computers, uh, plug in these phones, and then plug the computers into the phones. The phones act as like a mini switch. Um, they get power from the network switches, which we have, as uh, some of the board members know, uh, over the course of the last uh, five years, been in the process of upgrading through uh, federal grants that we're able to uh, be able to apply for due to uh, the board decision to do content filtering on the computers. Uh, so that allows us to do what is called the E-rate grant. And we've been you know, working towards that to make sure that we have the infrastructure to be able to go to these new systems. You know, back 11 years ago, um, there was voice over IP systems. Uh, we just did not go to them because they were very expensive. They were even included in the bid uh, in the bidding that uh, we received from the different companies. Um, but at the time, it was just very expensive. Uh, and when I'm saying expensive, you know, $57,000 is not, you know, something to throw uh, at. But, you know, these were over $100,000 systems um, at that time. So they have come down and we have the, uh, the infrastructure to be able to handle the, the needs of the phone system. But that is a wonderful question and very accurate. And so then we're, we're prepared to just go right into this phone system. It's not like we have to do all sorts of, um, uh, what do you call it, um, data upgrades, because you've been doing whatever you had to do just to keep yes. the computer ready for this. Okay, that's, Absolutely. that's great. Yep. All right, and then um, what I wanted, I, I know according to your documentation, the system's 10 or 11 years old and um, it's no longer being served and you can't actually obtain parts except for going on, uh, what is it? Um, eBay. I indicated eBay, eBay yeah. and you know other consolidation locations. So you're getting used parts that have been pulled from systems that have been upgraded. You know the company has chosen to yeah. upgrade, and uh, you know they perhaps uh, were bought out or sold, and you know now that some consolidation uh, agency is able to resell them. Right, right. So, um, so what would you say um, has been? your rate of service or repairs just in the past year with our system being as old as it is? So uh, with regards to the rate of repairs, um, I would say that typically, you know, per, in terms of like the phones themselves, they're pretty robust. Um, once in a while, there's maybe, you know, an accidental spillage of some sort of um, water or something. Uh, you know, the staff are pretty good with regards to keeping that type of stuff away from the technology. Um, you know, so those things, uh, you know, we chalk them up to just human error and we replace them. Uh, in terms of the back end, uh, that system is 11 years old, right? It's been running continually night and day. Um, I've had to replace several cards in them, uh, probably, you know, in the last, say, five years, maybe once or twice a year. Uh, perhaps something is going wrong with it. Um, the issue really is the fact that uh, even if I were to be able to procure something, which is basically um, kind of like a stab in the dark. Uh, so right now, uh, say tomorrow overnight, something happens with that phone system. Um, I come in in the morning, it's down, I'm looking at it. Uh, there is no one that I can contact that's an authorized service repair in order to assist me with it. Um, if I'm able to determine that uh, perhaps, say, one of the digital cards that powers perhaps 30-some phones uh, has gone down, um, yeah. I will look and see if I can find a digital card like that. In terms of programming it, if there is a, a component that requires a certified technician, um, I'm, we're in luck due to the fact that we have the relationship with Midco who installed it. They have continued to offer their expertise uh, with regards to uh, programming for that type of unit that we have, uh, but it's not anything that is actually supported by the manufacturer. So NEC basically says, uh, this is end of the line. We don't do anything with this. Um, right. and, and so, you know, if, if this, you know, if this was five, maybe even 10 phones, it was a system. Yeah, I, I'd say, you know, we can continue it. But at the same time, you know, if you're 
primary uh, business or relationship role with regards to the organization uh, has any kind of communication that has phone communication, you know, you're running the risk of being down for a, a substantial amount of right. time. With our system, that downtime, you know, obviously I indicated that, you know, it's a change of one, you know, overnight, we'll pull on our nighter and make sure the phones are replaced. But there's a lot of work that gets done prior to that to make sure that the system's configured. That kind of work, doing it expeditedly over maybe a course of two, maybe a week or a week and a half um, would, you know, increase yeah, the, the cost of them. the service integration mm -hmm. uh, exponentially, I would imagine. Sure. Okay. And, you know, and we try I, I to just, be good to it. I'm sorry. I, sorry. I, I just want to point out, uh, you used the word certified technician. There's no such thing as a certified technician uh, for the system any longer because it's it's basically been sold off and shut down and they don't run those programs midcode 10 uh, just happens to have somebody who was at one point in time a certified technician and knows enough about the phone system because it's basically frozen in history that they can come <laughs> in and they could um, help us out with it but part one is finding the parts if you don't find the parts you can't do anything the other thing i wanted uh, just to really make clear is that the current phone system that we have right now um, is a PBX system, which means that there is a proprietary box. Um, and that box is, is the point through which all the lines run. Um, if something goes down in that box, you got a problem, as Rich was just describing. The new system, uh, will be actually based on our computer network, which, as you all know, we just rebuilt last year. And all of that equipment is nice and fresh and new. And if there is a problem within one of the servers, which is supported by certified technicians and, and so forth, what we can do is actually take that system and uh, direct it to another server in our network and continue to be up. So, you know, there's, um, there's multiple points of failure. A lot of stuff really has to break bad all at once for us not to be able to communicate to uh, the outside world or to uh, patrons or residents. Um, you know, in, um, in, the, uh, in the new configuration. With the old configuration, um, you know, if we zap uh, because we get hit by lightning or something like that, and it takes a direct hit and fries a card, we are in trouble. Yeah. Okay, we are in I trouble. Understand. No, I, I okay. Absolutely, I understand. Um, right. I, have, I have another question. This system is... It's Mitel and it's being provided by Midco. And I know it's part of the governmental uh, procurement process. Um, what I'm wondering is what, why did we choose this phone system compared to whatever the other bidders offered? Like what are there specifications in this phone or options that made it stand out? Or are, you know, is there similarities? That's why all these bids were actually even um, considered. I'm trying to figure out how do you pick a phone system without variations that, that I, I would think there are variations. And, and so why did we pick this system? Oh, so if you take a look at the memo, um, very specifically this, uh, when we looked at the source well, uh, which was the latest uh, of these type of um, government RFP uh, requests, right, to go out to bid for unified communications, which is the, the general topic of what a phone system falls under. Um, as we've indicated, the uh, award was awarded to four companies. Uh, the highest points received was Mitel. Uh, they are also a manufacturer. So uh, to answer your question, it's, it's several things. Uh, one, they were the lowest qualified bidder. Um, uh, they offer a 40% discount and all that. And uh, Sourcewell went through and uh, evaluated that. And they have a, um, you know, several different documents that go through that of what the evaluation and the matrix were, which is identical to what we would have done. Um, and what we have done in the past where we went out to RFP ourselves and we went through a matrix. And as, you know, 
you've been uh, aware for some of these contracts, uh, you know, you go with the lowest and qualified bidder uh, as per law. And so that's what Mitel uh, was. Uh, so we engaged with them. Uh, we found that their lowest and qualified bid uh, had uh, all the technical specifications that were within the requirements of what uh, our replacement phone system uh, required after we had reviewed that with the staff and administration. Um, and then we proceeded uh, to do the configuration uh, based on the fact that all that information is in the uh, awarded contract with pricing and such. Uh, we went further as to also make sure that um, installations um, of my telephone systems, particularly the particular model and series that we're installing, um, so things that have been installed within the last year, year and a half. Um, we paid site visits to those locations, uh, including locations that uh, the end, re, uh, end partner, uh, in this case Midco, uh, had done the installation and integration. Uh, and we made sure that the phone system that was installed met the needs that uh, were being described um, so that you know, we were completely thorough with regards to the whole process. Um, but you know, the core of the, the process is exactly the same as if we were to do an RFP by ourselves. Um, it's followed, it's just that the, um, the library itself does not have the burden of going out and trying to go and get a big company um, that is providing a good quality product to give you, you know, a good discount. Um, I think we mentioned in there, uh, Greg did a wonderful job with regards to the memorandum, um, 127 separate RFP um, packets went out uh, to all the major vendors, integrators, manufacturers. Um, 14 chose to respond. Um, in, and Mitel was awarded one of those four awarding because uh, it's a multi-award contract, uh, but they were scored the highest. I believe specifically out of the thousand point scale that was utilized for uh, the matrix for the RFP, uh, they scored 197, 109 point, 107 points, I apologize. 907, uh, Rich. Yes, gosh, I, I'm looking at the screen, it's getting late. Uh, 907 points, and the second was 877, um, also to a local company. So, um, yeah, so that that's the reason. I, I, did that answer your questions? It, well, it, it's definitely uh, a great deal of information. I appreciate it. But my more specifically, so the four companies that were awarded, they're all, their phone systems are, are just like this one. The pricing so, is what the difference was. So what, what, what the awarding is, is done on a, on a scale. So you have a ranking of one, two, three, four. Uh, Mito was awarded um, number one. And that means it was the lowest and qualified. And so that's why we went with them. Uh, the other companies that were awarded were uh, integrators. So they were resellers of other phone systems. Um, they were not manufacturers. So between the fact that they were ranked number one with regards to the RFP, they were awarded the, the first point or the first position with regards to that contract. Um, you know, we would be remiss if we did not look at them and uh, first, and we looked at them first and found that they were qualified and they were the lowest. And so uh, coupled with the fact, like I already explained, going out to on-site visits to see local uh, installations in uh, special districts like public libraries, um, we found that everything that they had indicated in that uh, awarded contract that was pre-bid uh, was true. And so we're, you know, we, are going to go with them. That's why that's the presentation that you see before you and the, rec uh, the recommendation. Okay, so by any chance, the integrators, do they cover, do they carry more than one phone system? Some, some might. It depends on what that particular business is doing. Okay, and, and for some reason, they were part of this bidding process because the RFP or whatever they use must have designed a particular phone or is was any phone part of this RFP? I mean, the specifications weren't just for one type of phone system. So obviously these four companies that were awarded could be completely different phone systems. Is that how this works? They're very similar. Um, they're either hosted phone systems on premise 
Um, so they're on premise. Let's say let's use the word on premise. Um, hosted, meaning they're uh, not on premise. Um, the physical phones might be. Uh, however, the back end in, uh, servers are hosted out right. in a data center. Um, so those are the two typical flavors that uh, phone systems come in for businesses. And, you know, some of these, uh, you know, integrators have, you know, different companies and whatnot. I mean, I don't know what to answer your question, you know, with regards what more I can answer, right? We, we went with the lowest qualified bid. Uh, it was already, you know, procured with regards to uh, the RFP process. There is uh, ample documentation of that. Um, sure. You know. Okay, Great. no, that's Thank fine. You. And then and then my last question, I'll let you go. As far as staff, what do the, what option or options in this phone do they like about it that's different from the older system they have now? I mean, are they aware of what this phone could do for them yet? And have yeah, you but, gotten any feedback? I mean, we didn't do that? interviews with every single staff member. Well, we spoke with the supervisors and the administrative staff in order to go over what features um, are in inherently critical to uh, their voice communication needs. Um, we address those with the system to make sure that it had that. Um, in addition, it comes with things that are just pre-built due to the fact that it's a newer system, um, which we had explained and have explained and gone over. And um, what will happen is during the collaborative uh, process of uh, the next two months, uh, well, during the next two months that we'll do the configuration and, pr and actual configuration of the phones, there's going to be a collaborative process that goes through each department's, uh, let's say, the way the phones operate. And anything that uh, is an enhancement will be gone over um, and verify that that's oh, something sure. that they would like to use. So, I mean, the okay, primary reason you. for this is, is to replace. We're not trying to seek out new and leading edge technology. We're trying to replace the phone system uh, with something that is an appropriate phone system uh, at replacement. And that's what this is. Well, and, and hopefully there should be many additional options that would be able to expand what our staff needs to do now and make it easier. That's usually- You know, I, I can't speak- that. oh, That's great. I can't tell you one particular one that I, I know is on the minds of staff and uh, that is the voicemail integration. Uh, you know, currently our, our system is very fractured and we have limited licensing. Um, and so what that basically means is uh, the board, for example, you receive a voicemail attachment um, of any voicemail that you might particularly receive uh, from a resident or uh, if a resident uses the group distribution group, uh, uh -huh. you'll all receive a copy of that. And, you know, what, what happens is staff here have a phone that they have that voicemail sitting and blinking and they have to go into that phone system and they have to go and, and uh, listen oh. or, or delete or, or do some sort of interaction with that message. But they also have it on their, uh, their email and they're not unified. So that term unified oh. communication, that's like one wow. of the core uh, concepts that uh, is going to be very, um, you know, Interesting. That the that, that the staff will really enjoy and be able to utilize, uh, you know, to better their processes to respond to messages. Because if they get it on email, they delete it there. It's gone off the phone, or vice versa. Yeah. Um, and and so that I think one of that's one of the main wow. features that I think is a benefit out of this. Good to know. Thank you. Thank you so much yeah. for that. Absolutely. All right. Okay. And unless there's any further questions. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Cindy to do a roll call uh, with respect to the motion which is on the floor that is to award the contract to Midco. Okay, um, Linda? Yes. Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Um, I'm going to abstain. Becky? Yes. Diane. Diane. Yes. That's four yes. Um, oh no, Patty. Yes. Patty's vote yes. Okay. Yes. Did you hear? Yes. So, so five yeses, one abstain. Okay. All right, fine. Thank you very much. 
All right, uh, our next item is other. Uh, and if board members want to uh, raise something to discuss at this point, uh, you know, we can't take any action on it, but we certainly can discuss matters uh, during this section. Uh, Becky, I see your hand up. Yes, um, I have two things that I wanted to bring up. Um, so uh, the first one is something that we've already touched on tonight um, and is just kind of a reminder for all of us on the board um, about decorum and respect for each other. Um, this something I found is new to me. Uh, it's the Niles Main District Library Trustee Manual. I guess it was created when Tim Spadoni was president. Um, and so I just wanted to read a couple of things from here to help us all remember how to treat each other, I suppose, um, and some of the rules. Um, so under voting procedures, number six is once a vote is called for, no further comments or discussion will be allowed. Um, under voting, sorry, I said that one. Under board meeting and protocols, um, Number four, when two or more trustees address the presiding officer at the same time, the presiding officer shall name the trustee who is first to speak. Number five, a trustee when called to order by the presiding officer shall thereupon discontinue speaking and the order or a ruling by the presiding officer shall be binding and conclusive. And number seven, once an issue has been decided, it will not be revisited unless new inf information has come to light that could change the result. And I would just respectfully ask that all of us try to remember to do those things. Um, and then the other topic I wanted to bring up um, is something that we could discuss further at another time. Um, but since I am new to the board, um, sometimes it's still in a learning process here. Uh, when I came on board, Susan gave me a very nice tour of the library and I got to see all the backspaces and that was really interesting. Um, and I got a lot of information from her at that time. But I think there are some things um, that we could add to that in the future, um, namely what I, the document I was just reading from would be helpful to have um, some other things like I've, I've been finding lots of things, um, 12 golden rules for board members from United for Libraries, just I think that there's some things we could augment that with. And then as a board, um, maybe discuss how to, or I don't know if it's our job or Susan's job, but how to parcel it out so it's not so overwhelming all at once when you get on. Okay, Becky, thank you for those suggestions. Certainly we will have one or more new board members soon. Right. And so this is a timely uh, point to bring it up. And you know, Susan usually has taken the responsibility of making sure board members have some of the basic documents that we rely on, you know, of course our board manual, our, our bylaws and, and so forth. Uh, but I, I think certainly board members can make suggestions as to what types of information should be provided to board other board members in, in terms of what's been helpful to them, um, and maybe what what's what's important for board members to have first right away, and then maybe other things that can, they can try and absorb a little bit later because it, it's hard to read everything all at once. Um, so at once. we might also think about what's important for those board members to have right away, and what or other things that are good later on. And we could also make suggestions as to um, conferences that we've gone to in the past mm -hmm. that we have felt were uh, helpful. I think the Illinois Public Library Association is the one, Susan, that you think is most helpful, but there are others, the ALA, the ILA and so forth, they all have uh, programs too. And then other organizations do also that we have sometimes attended. So, um, you know, making sure and encouraging our new members in particular, but all of our members to attend these, uh, I think is, is something we, we should be doing. Um, I think it's really important for um, our members to be doing that. And again, it's a very appropriate time to revisit this when we will, we, we foresee that we will have one or more new members uh, soon. So, um, Okay. All right, uh, Peggy, was that it? Or was there yep. other things you wanted Thank to you. add to that? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, maybe that's something we can put on our agenda for further discussion at our next meeting. And people can come with their ideas as to specific documents, order in which 
um, things should be conveyed to the new board members, types of information, things like that. Is that, uh, is that something people would like to do at the next meeting? And I, I think it's appropriate to spend a little time doing that. Yes. Okay. All right. And I, and I think we can work into that, uh, the decorum that you mentioned, Tim's manual and, and so forth. Okay. And then when our new board members come on, and that will be not next meeting, but the next meeting after that, hopefully we will be sort of ready to go in terms of what should be provided to them. And Susan, I, I think you already sort of have a process by which you provide certain things. If perhaps in your next, the next packet that comes out to us, you can maybe list what you already do give people. So we're not, you know, telling you to do something you already do. Sure. Um, and then we can just look at that and think of, you know, as a board member, I think it helped me to have this, or, you know, it was important to read that right away, that type of thing. Any other thoughts on that? Anyone? Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Anything else for other? Uh, yes, Carolyn. Um, you know what, I, I wanted to request a copy of the corrected um, check register, no, yes, the uh, copy of the corrected check register from last month. Remember, there was um, some discrepancies between the check register and the consolidated um, income statement. And I think Susan emailed us the issue was numbers from the previous month, I believe, were left in the visa section. So that would mean that would be the document that would, was corrected. Am I understanding you, um, the way you explained it, Susan? I may have not put it quite right, Greg. Do you want to clarify what it was? So the check register was correct. What was not correct was um, a small amount of expenses related to the visa payment were not reflected in the income statement. So, if you want, I can give you the income statement, which will be off, yeah. which will be slightly Thank different. Um, okay. Oh, that's, I misunderstood where the error was. So it I is, think I did as well. No, that's fine. Okay, if I could possibly get a copy of that, because what I have in my records will make sense. I won't remember down the line. All right, I appreciate it. And then can I ask a question? I actually got um, a question from a resident about the phone system. And if Greg, if you could answer about it, maybe. phone systems, did you say? The new phone system, they had a question. Oh, okay, go ahead. I, my phone was off, so I didn't hear it. Um, is there a ground line for emergencies? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we have, uh, we buy, uh, Rich referred to it earlier. He called it plain old telephone service. Um, and that's actually uh, what the uh, phone companies call it. it. They're called POTS lines. And basically they're analog lines that come into the building just in case of emergency. But you cannot access them except from a few key points in the building if the phone system does go down. Um, you know, and um, then you have to bring the phone system up and then, you know, start transferring uh, through the, uh, transmitting through the PBX or in the case uh, in the future, the uh, server. Okay, well, thank you for that. Okay, uh, any other things for others? If not, then it looks like we've come to the end of our agenda. And I would like a motion to adjourn. Uh, that's why I saw several hands. Uh, Becky, uh, I will take yours. And then Patty as a second. Um, would you do a roll call, Cindy? Yes. Um, uh, yes. Diane? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Karen? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Six yeses. All right, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last one. Is everyone called? 
Yes, oh. six yeses. All right. Okay, fine. Well, thank you all. Um, I appreciate all the uh, good questions tonight. And uh, we'll have uh, Linda with us next month, but uh, that will be her last month as a trustee after many years of service, including service in various officer positions and uh, as a very active trustee throughout these years. So um, Linda, we look forward to having you as a full participant one more month. And uh, we hope we, we will be seeing you around the library after that too, of course. Of so, course. Uh, but for now, uh, thank you all. Have a good, uh, what's left of St. Patrick's Day. And I will see you all in April. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Happy St. Patty's.